Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 71. As it is the first full weekend of the month, that means it's the Patreon Q&A session. So buckle in, this one will last a little bit longer than normal. In terms of overall channel admin, there's not all that much this week other than I can finally announce that the detail of my trip to America in April will be locked in at last. Um, at some point over the course of the next week. So in Dry Dock episode 72, uh, the long-awaited fine detail schedule will be available for everyone to publicly view. So if you happen to be in any of the cities or near any of the cities that I'll be visiting in America and you're around at the time, um, if you haven't already got in contact with me, um, then you will then see from that when and where we can all meet up, which would be cool. Other than that, it seems like everything is coinciding relatively nicely in that the guide, five minute guide this week was guide 156, which for those of you who can do easy division means that that marks the channel's third anniversary. Additionally, this is uh, Dry Dock 71, but in two Dry Docks, we, uh, in, when we get to Dry Dock 73, it, the number of Dry Docks will equal the number of years since the commissioning of the last battleship, that of course being HMS Vanguard. And, according to the subscriber count, we're not too far away, um, maybe a month or so away, from... Um, hit, probably actually two, to be honest, from hitting the magical 100k subscriber mark, at which point, presumably, someone in YouTube will send me a fancy button, which I can put on the wall, which you'll then probably not see, because I don't do face-to-face -face videos much, if at all. Um, anyway, so that all seems to be uh, quite the nice combination of things, and so I think what I'm going to do is when... I'm going to combine them all into one, basically, and... So we're going to have a kind of a th channel is three years old dash 100k um, giveaway when we hit that 100k mark, um, which I say probably sometime in the new year. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I'm going to stock up on a bunch of different things for people to win. And uh, the only other thing to mention is that not all of the winners of the light cruiser design competition have come forward yet some of you have uh, so well done to you uh, those of you who haven't check back the last dry dock see if you've won and um, get in contact okay let's get on with this patreon edition q a so admiral tiberius asks you've been transported back to 1935 the royal navy has been gifted a substantially larger budget say 30 to 40 percent more uh, than it historically had and you've been placed in total command and control of all aspects of the budget, ship design, construction, new technologies, etc. You'd be in this position until 1942, and you'd have all your modern knowledge. Okay. Uh, what ship designs would you draw up or create, cancel or push forward? Um, what ship designs would be sent back to the drawing board? Which ones would be scrapped or overhauled? And what technologies or weapon systems would you push for, etc., etc.? Oh, well, this one's a, a little bit of a doozy, isn't it? Right, so, 30 to 40% budget increase. Well, that's going to solve an awful lot of problems. So, let me see, what can I do? Well, some of that money is just going to go into accelerating the build program somewhat, just to get more ships in service, since, I, well, I know what's coming. Um, so, that'll eat some of the budget up. But let's go through, the well, let's go through the fleet top to bottom, really. Now, given this is 1935, we'll start with battleships first, because at this time, battleships were seen as top of the tree. We'll go with carrier second. Um, so for the battleships, since I know that the London Naval Treaty is about to fall apart, and, well, actually, to be honest, I know what the Yamatos are going to be, um, but more on that later, I would, instead of letting the proposals for the triple fifteen and triple sixteen armed versions of the King George V drop, I would get have a quick evaluation done as to which is the more likely gun to be successfully produced quickly and go with take that one forward for development. 
um, even if I have to do it covertly, so that when the naval treaties do collapse, um, we're not left holding the can with the 14-inch armed King George V design while everyone goes up the scale. Um, and so you'd either get a three triple fifteen or three triple sixteen King George V. I have a feeling if you go with the triple sixteens, you're probably going to have to expand the design a little bit so they will move away from their position as possibly the closest to obeying the actual treaty, treaty battleships. Um, so it, it may be the triple fifteens, but either way, you end up with a better ship that with the guns that actually work. Um, <clears throat> at least at first ship. Um, then I would try and bring the Lion class design forward and since at this point it's a treaty uncapped obviously get the 16 inch guns um, into research ASAP obviously if we've got the um, 16 inch guns being developed for the King George V then oh, so much the better but with the Lion class I would immediately try and go accelerate that up to a nine, sort of late war so 1943 1944 era Lion design um, so three triple sixteens, but considerably larger than the initial um, design that was put forward. I would also, I wouldn't cancel the 5.25 inch gun because it has some merit later on in the war, as we've discussed as a long distance radar guided anti-aircraft weapon. But I would instead advocate for the continued development and expansion of the twin 4.5 inch, as I like to call them, frying pan mounts. And I would advocate for those to be used in the various um, new ships, including perhaps the Dido class, instead of the 5.25s, because I know that they're going to be production bottlenecks, and I know that they're also not going to be too brilliant for the early part of the war. So there's going to be some commonality already there, because uh, Renown has will have been re being refitted with them, and the later QE rebuilds, etc., um, oh, and so, yeah, I, I just had a quick thought, but anyway, so yes, the King George V and probably the Lions then would have five um, 4.5 inch twins instead of four 5.25 inch twins on either side, I would suspect. Also, with that extra money, that means that more ships can be brought in for refit. So first things first, it may come as a virtually no surprise that I would Paul Hood in for a refit in starting in 1936 so we can get her up to sort of a micro Vanguard spec. Um, I'd also make sure that Vanguard got built because and without delay, so that's always a, a useful thing to do. Um, that'd be interesting, a refit Hood and a Vanguard serving together in, in the middle of uh, World War II. Anyway... Um, I think for battle in battleship terms, that's probably about it. Um, a forty-five thousand ton Lion class design. You're probably going to be building those through to the middle of World War Two, and at that point, after that, there's not really much point in going anything further. Yeah, you could design something Montana or Yamato equivalent, but they're never going to be finished in time, and by the time they are finished, there's not going to be tremendous use for them. Um, so that wraps up the battleship side of things, with the exception of um, all those little minor details that you know about in the future, like the fact that the uh, high altitude control system, the fire control system for anti-aircraft weapons, has issues with tropical operation. So I'd get, I'd mention that to someone, get them to look into that, and uh, also things like ammunition falling apart for the pom poms and getting tracers issued as part of the standard. Um, I don't think... in Well, in 1935, the Mark 37 fire control system hasn't been developed, but I'd see if I could snaffle a few of those off the Americans later on. Um, but in it, since I can't do that initially, I'd push through hacks for um, and successors as quickly as I humanly could. Now, when it comes to aircraft carriers um i'm not going to tell the royal navy not to build the illustrious class but i am going to make a few suggestions to changes to the illustrious class uh, for example i'd probably thin the waterline belt down a little bit to save some weight but the most important thing even if the carriers then have to be built somewhat larger because again i know this treaty system is about to collapse so uh, doesn't really matter at that point they might be breaching the Washington Treaty and now I've got the money for it um, I would take 
the illustrious class and I would tell them categorically, one, you need to include at least a half-length secondary hanger rather than just go with a single hanger system. So that would basically be taking a riff off of what in the original timeline would be the indomitable. But using the weight saved from shaving down the waterline belt and also from possibly making the ships slightly larger, um, I'd try and modify the hangar design slightly so that it would be a little bit more open, although not much. This would mainly be for ventilation purposes um, and, and fire safety. The main thing I'd be doing is making sure that those hangars are much taller so that they can more easily fit aircraft uh, more comfortably um, and obviously more of them, which is always good. And then when it comes to, well, the implacables, I'd actually skip the implacable design completely and try and push for something more along the lines of an audacious class, um, which should be competitive, roughly speaking, with an Essex class. And if I'm getting them designed and built around the same time as the as the implacables were historically, they're going to be coming into service around the same time as well. Um, some of this money is obviously also going to have to go on... Um, <laughs> getting more workers into the shipyards because there's going to be a lot more ships being under construction and larger ones at that and manpower shortages were definitely a thing. Now with cruisers, with the town class I'm basically going to draw up a copy of Edinburgh and Belfast and say right we're going to build that straight off the bat. Everyone else is lying about the displacement of their light cruisers at this point. We might as well join the club and get something better out of it. Anyway, um, I'm also going to standardize the uh, medium anti-aircraft or heavy anti-aircraft gun medium uh, size armament at the 4.5 inch gun either in singles or twins. Um, across the board, which will give me a little bit better anti-aircraft firepower. Um, also cancel the unrotated projectile launchers and work on improving the 40mm pom-poms until I can send a nice man over to Bofors. To be perfectly honest, I'm probably not going to do anything with heavy cruisers because, well, the, the counties, apart from the various upgrades generally that I've spoken about earlier, the counties are the counties. They've got an, We've got an ability to refit them um, coming into the into the war which historically did occur and the Royal Navy doesn't really need that many more heavy cruisers um, at, at this point. Although I might be tempted to take one of the uh, truly absurd uh, sort of town class hull covered in twin 5.25 inch turrets concepts, convert that over to twin 4.5 inch concepts and have the anti-aircraft cruiser to end all anti-aircraft cruisers built as well, mainly for the reactions of well, any pilot who flies within about 10 miles of the thing. Continuing my standardization of the 4.5 inch gun, when it comes time to build the tribal class, they're not going to have the limited elevation 4.7 inch weapons, they're going to have four twin 4.5 inch guns, and then I'm going to try and standardize on the next with the next class, which obviously has um, only three uh, twin mounts and more torpedoes, and I'm just going to try and produce as many of them as possible. So every, all the destroyers, the new destroyers, will have uh, either three or four twin mounts of the 4.5 inch gun, which again will increase commonality. Uh, they've got higher fire rates and their elevation is high enough to become true dual purpose weapons, which will make my anti-aircraft efforts a lot more viable. In terms of submarines, I'm going to keep the T class, I'm going to bring forward the U class, and then I'm going to set people to designing a larger fleet submarine, which will probably resemble something along the lines of an Amphion or A class, um, but that will take a little while, so I'll leave it at that for the minute. I'm also going to draw up the plans for the late model flower and hunt classes and have them put on file ready for mass construction as soon as Germany starts even looking at Twitchy. And lastly, I'm going to agitate a lot more for the return of the fleet air arm to Admiralty control as soon as possible, at which point I'm going to be going out and inviting all sorts of interesting aircraft designs to come to the fore. In particular, I'm going to go to Westland and I'm going to say, right, that, that interesting new whirlwind fighter you've got going, look, j just forget the peregrine engines, stick a pair of merlins in there and then see if you can um, set, well, navalize it 
and make it carry bombs and or torpedoes, at which point this will become the primary strike craft of the Royal Navy's carriers. And if I can at all make it possible, um, at least until they work out how to get the uh, Spitfire converted to the Seafire, I might even try and go with uh, Whirlwinds as my primary carrier fighter at, as well. I say at least until it uh, can get a good single engine design worked up. And before this entire episode turns into the adventures of Admiral Drac Royal Navy, um, Robert Henry Ilston asks, um, follow up to the Age of Sail question I had concerning sailing characteristics of similar ships, were there any specific building techniques that would lead to specific sailing characteristics uh, beyond the most obvious hull length versus width speed relationship? Or any changes in hull characteristics such as white oak versus teak, etc.? Well, you've covered some of the more obvious ones there, um, with obviously if you can secure some uh, some certain types of wood that are a lot denser and uh, tougher than others, then obviously that's going to improve your uh, hull durability characteristics. Um, but there were other things such as the frames. So the frames of a wooden ship are obviously what hold the outside together. I mean, the frame of a ship holds ship sides together most of the time in any design but particularly so with wooden ships. So when you're building a ship of the line or similar vessel, the frames tended to be a lot closer together. On frigates, they could be spaced further apart because on something like a frigate, they would be spaced more towards what a ship needed for its sailing characteristics, whereas on, an, uh, on a ship of the line, you would make the frames unnecessarily close from a purely structural perspective, but by making them much closer together you made the ship a lot tougher um, and obviously the frames themselves are a lot more resistant to damage, which overall made the ship much, much uh, more durable in battle. Although of course this did mean the ship massed a lot more, which obviously made them slower. There was also the relationship between hull strength and mass and the sail plan. Um, because one of the things you've got to remember is, yes, the sails are pushing the ship along, but if you look at where the sails are mounted relative to their height, uh, the masts also act as massive levers, which will try and push the ship apart if the ship isn't properly built. Now, due to inertia, and uh, one of those wonderful Newtonian laws that objects in motion tend to stay at motion and objects at rest tend to stay at rest, um, because of that, uh, if you want a ship that can accelerate and decelerate quickly, as well as obviously being fast, you want something built like a frigate, which will obviously then uh, be able to manoeuvre and get away from things a lot, a lot better. However, when you do that, the hull is necessarily built somewhat lighter, which means that you can't put on quite the same level of canvas as you can on a ship of the line, because, well, the hull just won't stand up to it. However, you can raze a ship of the line, albeit that's a fairly expensive um, way of going about things, which gives you a lower, lighter hull um, that is much like a heavy frigate, but that hull is built to ship of the line standards, which means it can take the massive rigging that was previously moving around, say, another third of the ship in height and probably 25% of its mass, which means all of a sudden you've got, okay, a a heavy hull, but a hull that's propelled by an absolutely gargantuan spread of sail, which the hull can withstand, and whilst this kind of ship will not accelerate anywhere near as fast, once it gets going, it's gonna get going at a pretty sharp clip, and good luck stopping it. Uh, it has the other advantage compared to frigates of it will tend to plough straight through um, several grades of, of rough sea, which means that it will actually retain its speed in rough seas better than frigate designs. And this was one of the main worries of uh, US frigates in the War of 1812 at the latter stages um, when various Razaid capital ships started showing up, because whilst the US frigates were fast and whilst they were more heavily built, uh, they were built along um, ship of the line standards, but not to them. Whereas when true ship of the line standard built Razay frigates started showing up, um, then they were actually able to catch to catch the American frigates, as although on paper their speeds were similar, 
the Razay frigates could actually maintain those speeds in rougher weather, and since obviously the weather changes all the time, that would hand the advantage in anything but a flat calm to the Razay frigate, at least in terms of being able to catch them. Uh, there's also, in terms of stability, the introduction of tumble home. Now, whilst that's, as we've discussed in other videos, not necessarily the wisest idea on a steam and steel warship, for wooden ships it was actually quite useful because it meant you could build ships larger and able to carry heavy lower gun decks while, without making them too unstable. Um, this is something you'll actually notice if you look at replicas of galleons and such ships in the, from sort of 15th, 16th century possibly you go even going into the 17th, their sides are very, very much more slab-sided. Um, so, for example, in London, there's a replica of Drake's Golden Hind, and, yeah, it's it's pr it's pretty vertical all the way. Whereas if you go and look at something like Victory, um, you can see the, the upper hull work starts to pull in. So that obviously makes the ship more stable, um, and that will affect its sailing characteristics as well. And I think the last one I'll mention for this question is, in terms of the sail layout, uh, yeah, that, that could affect things quite dramatically. Um, you had your square sails and you had your lateen sails, which are the sort of triangular fore and aft sails, each of which has their advantages and disadvantages. Advantages: The lateen sail is a more handy sail. Uh, the square sail obviously catches a much larger amount of the wind, but it's also about how you lay those out um, and that's not just in terms of where you put the mast on the ship in to, uh, to provide propulsion, but it's also how they interact with each other. Because one of the worst things you can do is position everything in such a way that you have your absolute big, bigger sails at the back, because that will just create a massive windbreak, and your middle and forward mast, if you're on a three-masted ship, then will catch nothing. And this is why ships were often actually fastest sailing a few points off of the wind direction as opposed to dead ahead because if they were dead ahead then the sails on the rear mast would serve as a partial windbreak for the sails on the middle mast and the middle mast would then um, serve as a much larger windbreak for the sails at the foremast and well you weren't getting as efficient as you would if you turned a couple of points to port or starboard and then the wind was catching e most of each of the sails individually thus providing actually greater force and therefore speed. James Sean Moore asks, was USS Keokuk just a failed project, or did she show some promise? So for those of you unaware, uh, the Keokuk was one of the uh, more eccentric ironclad designs that would emerge on the Union side of the American Civil War. Um, being an ironclad, um, also almost entirely made of iron, um, and as you can see here, somewhat odd in, in design, um, she had, well, quote-unquote, turrets. They were less turrets and more of uh, armoured casements, or perhaps turrets in the traditional castle sense. They didn't move, they just had multiple firing ports, and then you could rotate the Dolgren gun that was inside to fire out of the appropriate port. Um, her main disadvantage was that her armour reflected the fact that the US at the time wasn't really capable of producing um, full-scale iron armour in the necessary quantities or the necessary quality th in terms of uh, thickness and size. So she had this weird composite which was a l various layers of iron bars and pine all put together with various thin iron plates bolted over the top. And this did not serve her particularly well when she ended up fighting Confederate forts um, and ending up to, a little bit too close for comfort to Fort Sumter, um, where she was promptly shot through because, in a manner similar to the Galena, she was technically armoured, um, but her armour was not strong enough to stand up to most of the shot that was being thrown at her, so she was put into a situation um where she got far too close and was then shot to pieces. Now, she did have some innovative techniques. I mean, her she actually had bow and stern um, tanks to allow, not for submersion, she wasn't a submarine, but to allow her to raise or lower the hull, um, which obviously made her a smaller target and gave the, some protection uh, in terms of water. Now, in terms of a design which was operating under a restricted budget and restricted technology base, 
particularly the fixed turret idea with the multiple gun ports was definitely not a bad idea. Um, she definitely had some promise in that department, and the, the, especially in the coastal warfare, the ability to raise and lower the ship to, uh, as we said, to increase or decrease the target profile or seaworthiness, again, is definitely something worth uh, commending. Those aspects of her design were good, and her speed as well at nine knots was actually pretty respectable for an early uh, Union ironclad. Her main issue was just that absolutely awful armour. Um, so I would say she definitely wasn't a complete failure. She was made into something of a failure by the restrictions imposed by what armour they could get hold of, but if you'd, say, taken that design and either produced it in the latter part of the American Civil War or in peacetime in another country of the period that perhaps had slightly better abilities to manufacture armour, which, to be honest, at that point is basically either France or Britain, the basic design is sound. Let's say the, float the flotation tanks concept is very novel, and if she'd been built with... Well, her total hull thickness of 5.75 inches. If she'd been built with a 5.75 inch rolled or hammered British or French iron plate instead of the composite armour, she probably would have been one of the most durable um, and workable ironclads in the Union Navy. So yeah, she definitely had promise, um, just held back a little bit by the technological circumstances she found herself in. Bill Cunningham asks... It's October the 26th, 1597, and you, sir, are Todo Takatora. How do you win the battle? And for those of you wondering who that is, that's the Japanese Admiral who was lucky or unlucky enough to be facing off against Korean Admiral Yi Sun Sin at the Battle of... I have no idea how to pronounce this. Myeon Genyang? Uh, question mark? Um, <laughs> now, on the face of it... This seems to be a relatively easy battle because the Japanese have um, over 130 warships and even more sort of logistics, transport, supply ships behind them. Um, whereas, thanks to Korean politics, uh, Admiral Yi had been dismissed. Someone else had taken over his navy, managed to get it almost entirely destroyed, and left him with just over a dozen ships. Now, I say it sounds easy, uh, but Toto Takatora would actually lose the battle um, uh, to Admiral Yi. Now, part of the reason that the battle was lost was thanks to the currents, which is why it's sometimes called the Battle of the Roaring Currents, um, as halfway through the battle, the current reversed uh, with the tide and swept the Japanese ships back onto each other in confusion and without the ability to manoeuvre. Now, although the Japanese had a massive numerical advantage, they couldn't use that advantage because, well, they are in the middle of the straits. So what I would do if I was the Japanese admiral, given that it's about a 50-mile diversion to go around the island and come in from the north, is I would probably split my combat fleet 60-40. So I'd keep 60% of my combat fleet with the transports, and then I would send the rest of my combat fleet around the island, because at the moment, Admiral Yi, with his 13 ships, can't afford to be anywhere but where he is. Um, I'd then wait at the entrance to the Straits, um, and, well, 50 miles, a day, maybe a, maybe a little bit more, but probably around a day's worth of sailing. So the next day, I'm having left instructions with the sort of opposite, my opposite number, I would send in my attack wave of uh, ships from my main force, uh, head up the channel with the current. Meanwhile, the rest of my force would be blockading Admiral Yi from the other end of the channel, uh, much closer in. And then when the current starts to shift, not only by having a lesser concentration of force in front of him do I not have quite so many issues with ships running into each other and getting all confused, but that will also sweep down my fleet that's gone around and bring them in behind uh, the Korean ships, at which point they can continue the attack. And, well, at that point, the Koreans are a little bit stuffed because they've got a choice of either trying to pursue uh, 
my fleet that's being pushed back by the current, having obviously fought for a while and got tired from that, or they've somehow got to get their own ships around and then fight against the current to come in to counter my ships that are approaching them from behind. So, yeah, basically a, a delayed pincer movement uh, would be how I'd try and win that battle. Christopher Dent asks, Who would have won the Lobster War if the French and Brazilian navies had actually come to blows? And, well, as the name suggests, this was a dispute in the early 1960s over who should have the right to fish for lobsters. Well, I suppose the UK got involved in the Cod War, so this is not really that much more absurd, although there was the rather interesting premise of whether a lobster is a fish or not. Now, in terms of uh, it being a shooting war, it kind of depends on when that war erupts and who's doing what. Um, initially, um, if it sort of the first stage, if it erupts into a shooting war, the Brazilian navy is going to walk it quite easily because they have um, significantly more forces, shockingly, off the Brazilian coast as compared to the French. Um, the French basically have one modern destroyer and a little aviso, and uh, well, the Brazilians have the Brazilian Navy, plus anyone from the Brazilian Air Force who might choose to show up. Now, the French did have a larger formation um, off West Africa who could have popped over to have a go. Now, that would have been uh, the carrier Clemenceau, um, or Clemenceau, I think, I don't know which way I have away. Um, then you've got an anti-aircraft cruiser, um, the De Grasse, and uh, two escorting, uh, again, modern destroyers, um, then five smaller destroyers, dash corvettes, and a tanker. The Brazilians also have a carrier, the Minas Gerais, but it's almost certainly going to be limited to anti-submarine operations. Uh, they have a submarine, um, ex-American, they have two Brooklyn-class well, light cruisers, um, the ex-Philadelphia and the ex-St. Louis, um, and they have six destroyers and a corvette, although, again, these are all ex-US ones. They're not quite as modern as the, um, the larger French destroyers. So if it gets to the shooting war at that point, I guess it probably comes down to whether or not the Brazil a mixture of the Brazilian Air Force and the anti-aircraft firepower of the Brazilian Navy can hold off the Etendard strike fighters of the Clemenceau. Because if the Brazilian Navy gets into surface-to-surface -surface action with the French Naval Task Force... That's not the whole French Navy, but it's the other task force that they sent there. That I can't actually see going well for the French. Um, because it's the early 1960s, and sort of missile technology as a whole isn't really quite there. And they have a two cruiser to one advantage. And to be perfectly honest, I think um, either of the two Brazilian cruisers, at least on paper, is capable of taking out the French single cruiser. Um light ship numbers are about equal but most of the brazilian ships are better gun platforms uh, well they they have more guns um, for a start which which kind of helps um and uh so yeah if if it gets down if it gets down to a surface action i think the brazilians will edge it but that is predicated on the brazilians being able to hold off the French airstrikes for long enough, um, and the French, um, and obviously, the French will have to be worrying about Brazilian air force strikes. So it could it could go either way, and of course, the French have more than just their task force. So long term, the French will, if they want, if they choose to drag it out, they will win. Um, but with the forces that they have on hand off West Africa. Yeah, it, it's just going to come down to that. Do modernised anti-aircraft gun systems in the early 60s have a chance against a couple of dozen jet strike aircraft from a carrier? If yes, the Brazilians win, and if no, the French win. <laughs>
Von Hindenburg asks, It seems that the Italians started World War II with insufficient fuel reserves. Was this a result of poor planning, corruption, lack of funds, war happening too soon, early colonial conflicts, etc., taking more resources than expected, or something else? Well, many of the factors you list there are partially responsible. I mean, certainly it's pre-World War II uh, antics um, trying to establish a new Roman Empire in North Africa uh, certainly drained some of its fuel reserves to a degree. However, you have to also bear in mind that, well, the war started earlier than they expected, um, thanks to Germany's antics, and it also ended up with them facing off against a lot more people than they expected. Because bear in mind, the Italian Navy was, well, like the Kriegsmarine actually, was not built to fight the Royal Navy. Um, both navies had actually been built with fighting the French in mind. Um, and in, in that respect, the Italians were slightly ahead of the French in some respects. Not all. Um, the French had Dunkirk and Strasbourg for a start, which gave them a, an upper hand in the early part of the war until the Latorias would come in service, cause, but the Latorias would have come into service slightly faster than uh, the Richelieu's, so yeah, much of muchness. But the Italians were anticipating, if they had to fight anybody particularly substantial, it would be the French, and that would allow them to still access certain um, supply lines for oil. And at the end of the day, the Mediterranean is a relatively small operational theatre, so it wouldn't be like they needed fantastically large amounts of oil anyway. And they would hope, or they did hope, that the war would be of a relatively short duration. Getting involved in a fight with the British, where they'd end up having to fight for control of the entirety of the Mediterranean for years on end, was not on the cards. So it was, I think it's a case, mostly a case of the war starting too early and it being the wrong war. They weren't ready for that particular kind of war. There were, there were things with corruption and lack of funds to a certain degree, but nowhere near as much as that. Um, yeah, it was basically a case they had the fuel reserves for the war they thought they were going to fight and they ended up in pretty much the worst possible war scenario that they could actually end up fighting in. Um, and... Yeah, once with the British contesting and then later controlling North Africa, that's pretty much access to any nearby oil cut off, and uh, you're a bit stuffed at that point. Jorg2 asks, when did boarding fall out of favour as a major tactic? So, of course, as we know, boarding's never quite fallen out of favour entirely, but as a major tactic... It's probably as a result of a confluence of three major things, and that would be steam power, shell guns, and slatterly armour. And the reason for that is that when you talk about combat boarding in battle, you need, well, you need to come alongside, that's fairly obvious, um, but that means that the enemy, if they're in a, well, if they're in a position to win a boarding action, they'd be trying to board you. So assuming that your enemy is not wanting a boarding action, that means that you usually either have to be able to outsail them, um, which you would do by a combination of, well, being the better sailor in being faster, more maneuverable, etc., but also by disabling their means of propulsion by taking out the masts. You'd also have to try and suppress their guns or there's no hope that their guns will not cause too much damage once you slam close together, um, albeit the boarding action to the ship does tend to distract the gunnery crew somewhat. And then finally, um, you try and suppress any enemy guns that were around, especially deck guns that might rake your boarding party before you attack. Now, the rise of the steam engine makes the first part much more difficult because the steam engine opens up a lot more options for manoeuvrability since it takes away reliance on the wind and they're a lot harder to take out than the sails are. So that means it makes it much easier for an enemy ship to refuse a boarding action even if everything else has been knocked out. Now then you've got the rise of the shell gun and 
whereas a large ship of the line might very well be able to withstand a salvo or two at close range from its opponent in order to secure boarding action and capture the ship, the faster firing and more explosive guns of, say, the 1840s, 1850s, which is around the same time you see the rise of the steam engine, mean that that could very well could be fatal for the ship in question. Um, and also you could be assembling a couple of hundred men in a boarding party and one broadside with a decent lot of shell guns, and that's a lot of very dead men. So that factors finally into the armour question, which is more of a secondary issue, but, but it, basically with armour it means, especially the early ironclad armour, it means that it makes it much harder to actually disable the enemy shipping um, in the first place, especially it makes it much harder to knock out their guns, which makes it a lot more dangerous for you to approach in the first place. So I'd say boarding as a major tactic in combat probably became really impractical around the late 1840s and early 1850s when you had shell gun firing steamships around. Soft Llama asks, I've been reading some of the books I've recommended and I know that bows came in different shapes, ram, straight stemmed and cruiser type. Are there any others I forgot? Also, what is a knee bow, a bow knuckle and scantlings? Uh, thanks for the great presentations. Well, thank you. So, from the period you're describing, you're probably talking about, well, the, the classic steam and steel era, uh, 20, early 20th century. So, on top of uh, ram bows, straight stemmed bows, and cruiser type bows, there are a couple of others. So, during that period, you also have, towards the end of it, the, the first bulbous bows. Um, this involves having a, uh, well, a big bulb at the base of the ship's uh, bow underwater, and that helps with uh, improving speed and efficiency in a manner that's been described in another dry dock video. Um, you've also got the so-called Atlantic bow, or flared bow, um, and that is uh, sort of a forward curved uh, or raked bow, um, i.e. The, the absolute front of the bow is further forward than it is at the waterline, which in turn is further forward than it is at the base. Um, and with, with that extra flare, it helps the ship cut through the water and deflects a lot of... Um, water away from the ship and in the second part of your question a knee bow well it's more accurate to say it's a bow knee um, this is basically where mainly on wooden ships um, where the, the you have a piece of wood um, which obviously is why it's more frequent in wooden ships um, it can be other things as well but wood's are more common um, where the bow stem i.e. the vertical or near vertical part of it um, curves or it turns at an angle over into a continuous section that's also then parallel with the keel um, which appears in side profile somewhat like uh, the profile of someone's knee when they're kneeling down um, and this is a relatively useful feature uh, for tying the ship's overall structure together especially as say in wooden ships where it introduce it well in, in doesn't introduce it removes a point of weakness at a point of great stress in the ship because it's all one piece so it's less likely to break apart or work its way apart um, so that's that bit a bow knuckle is a feature on specific kinds of bulbous bow and that's where the bulbous bow curves upwards such that the top of the um, bulbous bow is actually higher than the point where said bulbous section joins onto the rest of the ship. And scantlings are, in the, in the loosest term, they are the dimensions of what you might colloquially call the ship's skeleton, the, the, the framing, the, the body of the ship onto which you stick everything else like hull plates and machinery etc. Um, doesn't include the keel for whatever reason. Um, so yes, yeah, so you might ha you could describe the ship's scantlings as dimensionally, which is what they are, as the full length of the ship's um, skeleton when it's before it's been plated, if you're talking about plating. Um, but a scantling dimension can 
be pretty much any component of the ship. So you could have a scantling dimension for the engine room, for example, if the engine room can be defined as a kind of a, a girder box area. Or the magazines might have scantling dimensions if you're supporting them, um, again, within their own section of the ship. The Hand of Ray asks, Going off the video of Merzel Kabir, who do you believe are the seven most awful admirals, captains, commanders, etc., through naval history, be it from incompetence, inexperience, cowardice, general recklessness, or just plain madness, and what was their impact on history? Ooh, top seven. Well, you referenced the Merzel Kabir one, so that's an easy low-hanging fruit, so let's not go over that one, lest I start getting very angry and ranty again. Um, let's go with the top seven most awful admirals, captains, and commanders throughout history who aren't named Jean Soule. Um, I am going to go with, shockingly, uh, the B.T. Seymour pairing. Um, yeah, that's... What their impact on history was they got a lot of people killed unnecessarily, and they almost got a lot of other people killed unnecessarily. I was doing a quick refresher for myself on the Battle of Jutland recently, and I was reminded, oh yes, just how much I loathe and despise those two. Um... Yeah, when when you nearly send the pride of the Royal Navy into the jaws of death, purely because you seem to have literally no idea of what an appropriate signal is, nor how to hoist or, or execute the signal, how the heck do you end up in command of the second largest formation in the British Navy? Just how? And why? And if you ever wanted to make... A, a good argument as to why there was no such thing as natural justice in the world. You could point to the performance of the battle cruiser fleet at Jutland and say, look, if there was anything like a modicum of natural justice, a gigantic flaming meteor would have come through and neatly lopped off the HMS Lion's bridge several months before the battle. Oh, anyway. So, going from the British, let's head over the channel to the French. And, uh, yeah, it might seem like another low-hanging fruit, but, uh, Admiral Villeneuve, um, sailed out to face Nelson, not because he thought he could win, in fact, he was pretty sure he wouldn't, um, not because he thought his ships were prepared, he was also pretty sure they weren't, and not because he thought that his numerical advantages meant much, he put to sea and this may seem to be something of a recurring theme, purely out of pride because he heard Napoleon and was sending somebody to replace him. And then having sailed out, and apparently being relatively familiar with Nelson's tactics, and realising that Nelson would probably try and cut his line in several places, which is exactly what Nelson ended up trying to do, he proceeded to do nothing in particular to try and stop him. In fact, he just stretched his fleet out in a nice long line and offered it up. Um, so, yeah, it's like you, you, you know your ships aren't ready, you know your men aren't ready, you know what the enemy's tactics are, and you sail out to face him anyway for a point of pride and then proceed to do absolutely nothing to actually try and mitigate the disaster that you know is about to come. You can kind of see why Napoleon wanted to replace him. Next up, uh, the Italian admiral in charge of the Italian fleet at the Battle of Persano, uh, the Battle of Persa the Battle of Lissa, the Admiral Persano, um, yes, he, who not only threw everyone into confusion by sending out multiple orders, he then managed to get the front part of his fleet wandering off, changed flagships, didn't tell anybody, and then took one of the more modern and possibly more effective units in the Italian fleet. Uh, which he'd taken as his new flagship, as we said, without saying anything to anybody, and then sat out the battle behind the lines, leaving the rest of his fleet wondering why the what they thought was the flagship wasn't sending any signals, whilst, as we said, one of their more modern units just sat and watched. Uh, shockingly, the Italians lost that battle. Uh, I mean, I think Admiral Tegethoff and uh, SMS Kaiser had something to do with it as well, but I think Persano helped. I think maybe the maybe Tegethoff should have recommended Persano for a medal. 
While we're on the subject of Italian admirals, Admiral Iacchino of the Italian Navy um, has of the first, of the Second World War has to be up there, um, given that well, he managed to he managed the unusual feat of being an admiral who was terrible from both ends of the spectrum. Uh, first, managing to get the Italian Navy all wound up and then having a bunch of its ships blown up at the Battle of Cape Matapan by flat out ignoring everybody who was telling him that there were a ton of British battleships nearby. And then subsequent to that, seeing British battleships under every rock tree, wave front, storm cloud, and it basically any other object that could possibly conceal anything larger than two microns. Um, yeah, and as a result, basically not really leading his fleet to much of anything, even at a time when the Italian fleet actually had a pretty decent chance of giving the Mediterranean fleet a run for its money, or indeed defeating it outright in open battle. Um, there were so many admirals who could have taken exactly the same forces that he had and inflicted some pretty nasty losses on the Mediterranean fleet, um, but he didn't, because he saw war spites everywhere. I mean, well, to be fair, if you knew the war spite was coming after you, you might be a little bit nervous about things, but um, I think he took it a little bit too far. Next, and this is possibly in light of how he stands up compared to his contemporaries, uh, would be Admiral Hotham of the Royal Navy um, in the Napoleonic Wars. And I give him a place on this list largely because of his actions once he was actually given command of a full fleet. He seems to have actually been a reasonably competent, brave, and quite efficient subordinate officer. But once he'd actually been made a full admiral and had command of his own forces, he twice had French fleets on the run at the Battle of Genoa and the Battle of Hyares Islands. And both times he kind of chased them for a bit, let his forward ships shoot up the rearmost French ships for a little bit. And then just when he had the French in the palm of his hand and could have crushed them, he fell back and ordered his ships to withdraw, even though others of his officers were saying, why? What are you doing? There's, this is no time to withdraw. We have victory in our grasp. And he's like, no, no, I, I don't think so. We're just going to go home. So yeah, two, two potentially massive victories that he completely threw away. So that's that's pretty bad. I mean, he didn't get as many people killed as some of the other admirals uh, we've mentioned. Um, but yeah, you, you were basically served a win on a plate and you chucked it overboard. Then we can go back a little bit further in time, and I'm going to name someone that many people probably haven't heard of. Um, Shimazu Yoshi, Yoshihiro, who was the Admiral, who was the last Japanese Admiral to face Admiral Yi Sun Shin, um, who we have discussed in an earlier question. Now, the reason I nominate him in particular is, well, as we discussed in the uh, in a previous question about what if I ended up being the Japanese Admiral who faced Admiral Yi at an earlier battle, that battle rather established that it didn't matter what your numerical superiority was, you don't fight Admiral Yi in a narrow strait where he can take full advantage of the fact there's too many of you and there's not that many of him. So, having learned this lesson rather painfully, what do you guess Admiral Sh Shimazu Yoshihiro did when he had about the same number of ships as his predecessor had had, only now Admiral Yi had something like ten times the number of ships that he'd previously had. Yeah, you guessed it, he decided to fight Admiral Yi in a strait. And guess how well that went? <laughs> um, yeah, 300 ships deployed, 200 ships lost. And that was pretty much that as far as Japanese uh, invasion efforts of Korea went, at least for that period of history. Yeah, well done repeat exactly the same mistake and, unsurprisingly, get exactly the same result. And finally, um, I kind of have to include Admiral Halsey on this one. He doesn't quite deserve the same level of verbal beatdown as many of the other admirals on this list, because it has to be said he did a very good job in the early to mid part of the Pacific War. Um, you can't take that away from him. He was, at that time, very much a admiral that the US Navy needed, very aggressive, very determined to win at all, nearly all costs. And he brought the US Navy around in quite a number of ways, and he did also make uh, recommendations when he became ill that 
resulted in the command team that would win the US the Battle of Midway. So, I say, good at that point, but he seems to have been just a little bit of a one-track admiral. So, aggressive in attack, fantastic when it was needed. Uh, the latter part of the war, you could have taken the foot off the accelerator just a little bit, but didn't, and as a result, well... You ended up with a Battle of Leyte Gulf, where the only reason that we don't now read about a complete and utter disaster of an invasion resulting in a small US task force being sunk and then thousands, if not tens of thousands, of US Marines being blown out of the water in their transports or shelled mercilessly on the beaches is purely because of the massive fight that Taffy 3 put up at the Battle of Samar. And then, I mean, that could be a error of judgment that anyone could make and then after that he managed to take his fleet into a typhoon twice resulting in more men and ships lost in those two incidents as well as damage um, than was inflicted by a great number of Japanese kamikaze attacks so yeah um, by the end of the war probably something of a liability to US forces uh, although, as I say, you can't take away from uh, his earlier achievements. Dave Collier asks, I've recently been caught out by an epic practical joke weeks in, in the making, and it puts me in mind to ask about the most famous or infamous practical joke in Royal Navy history. So could you tell us a bit about the Dreadnought hoax? OK, so this one's going to take a little bit of a backstory. The central figure in the Dreadnought hoax was one Horace Devere Cole, who had served in the Second Boer War and was then invalided out of service due to wounds taken. He then decided that he was going to go to university after having had a military career, uh, because apparently that's the correct way of doing things. Um, and at university he decided he was going to prank, hoax, and otherwise confuse practically everybody in sight. Uh, he made a number of friends, including the, the person who would later become a Virginia Woolf, the famous author, and they decided, before the Dreadnought hoax, to pull off a hoax that would have suspiciously similar, and as we'll see later, somewhat ironic, um, parallels to what they would later do to the Royal Navy. And that is specifically in 1905, they decided that they were going to dress up as the uncle of the Sultan of Zanzibar, who was visiting uh, the area, or visiting the UK at least, and as the distinguished royal party related to the Sultan, they would then arrive in Cambridge, where obviously their university was, and they would uh, try and fake their way into having a tour around Cambridge and the university in particular. They had originally wanted to portray the Sultan of Zanzibar himself, but as his photo had recently been published in the newspapers, they thought that would be pushing their luck a bit too far. So, of course, donning makeup and costume, as you can see here, they actually pulled it off, despite the fact that they were walking around the town and the university campus where they were in fact studying, and therefore walked past quite a number of people they actually knew who didn't recognise them. I mean, to be fair, looking at the photo, some of them, at least from the photograph, seem relatively convincing. I'm not necessarily sure I'd have been convinced that the guy on the left was actually from Zanzibar, though. Anyway, this little uh, escapade made it into the newspapers and obviously got wide circulation across Britain. Now, the next stage of things about five years later, came about when, shall we say, there was a little bit of a friendly internal dispute in the Royal Navy, specifically the cruiser HMS Hawk and the brand new battleship HMS Dreadnought. Well, their officers had a little bit of a friendly rivalry, and so one of the officers on HMS Hawk remembered that, oh yeah, I have a friend who was in a newspaper about pranking people. I think I have a plan. So, of course, he wrote to Cole and said, well, can you pull off something similar with Dreadnought? Because that would be hilarious. And uh, so he did. He rounded up much the same group as before with a few extra additions. And with the help of some theatrical costume, again, a bunch of makeup, etc., and some turbans, they decided that they were now going to impersonate the Abyssinian royal family. <laughs> 
with two of their friends coming in as supposedly interpreters. Then, one of their friends, who was going to remain in English attire, pretended to be a Home Office official, went into a telegram office, or telegraph office, and sent a telegram to the commander of the port that Dreadnought was in, saying, oh, the Abyssinian royal family are going to be coming down with interpreters, can you please show them around the ship and the fleet? And, well, information security being what it was at the time, they bought it. So, coming down the train, off stepped this unlikely little crew. And yes, that does include Virginia Woolf, who is most very definitely a white woman, pretending to be an Abyssinian man with a fake beard. And uh, the Royal Navy fell for it, hook, line and sinker. Again, one of them actually had relatives serving aboard Dreadnought who did not recognise uh, his relatives who were in disguise. Additionally, they had a few, shall we say, other issues to worry about, namely that... The fake beards, for those of them who didn't have beards, were held on with water-based glue, and the makeup was not the kind of modern makeup that can stand up a little bit to water. It would have run off completely if they encountered such things as, say, rain, or if they tried to eat or drink anything. So, being British weather, of course, it did start raining, so they all had to scurry for cover, pretending that they didn't like it. And when they were offered food and drink, they had to pretend that it had been prepared properly and so refuse it. And of course, none of them actually spoke the language that was spoken in Abyssinia, so they had to learn a few phrases of Swahili and mix that up with a bunch of nonsense phrases concocted out of Latin and Greek, which most of them did know, um, but which apparently most of the officers aboard the Dreadnought ha did not recognise. Of course, once they had been happily sent off the ship, at the conclusion of what everyone thought was a very successful tour, uh, the prank eventually obviously made its way into the newspapers, where everybody found it absolutely hilarious and the Royal Navy was incredibly embarrassed. There was, however, one last item in this tale, which was the fact that, as we said, they didn't actually know anything about the language actually spoken by the Abyssinian royal family, and so they decided that the appropriate exclamation for surprise-appreciation-amazement to something like, say, when they were shown Dreadnought's armament, was to shout, Bunga Bunga Gedelika! Which is probably severely racist. Um, but anyway, uh, the that particular phrase caught on quite a bit, um, and was, uh, yeah, it became something of a little catchphrase. Um, you may recognise it having been recycled and reused over time during the 20th century, but it then meant that in World War I, when the Dreadnought became the first and only battleship to sink an enemy submarine by ram, it obviously got lots of congratulatory telegrams. Someone, however, had remembered the incident uh, over half a decade ago, and so one telegram they received just read, Bunga Bunga. So, <laughs> quite a uh, Quite the uh, humorist obviously sent that one. So yes, there you go. A brief summary of how in 1910, when the Navy was equipped with battleships with displacing over 20,000 tonnes, all sorts of fancy technological marvels in terms of engines, hydraulics, guns, rangefinders, etc. And everyone considers themselves very well educated and intelligent. A bunch of university students wearing what was effectively boot-polished theatrical costumes and fake beards managed to con their way aboard the Royal Navy flagship. Video Dude 26 asks, In World War II, the US fielded the 127mm 51-calibre, 38-calibre and 25-calibre systems, or 5-inch for those of us who are still stuck in Imperial. Now, I understand that these weapons were designed for use with different ammunition as they had different roles, but I always assumed that the reason for the proliferation of 127mm guns was so that they could share ammunition in a pinch, either for logistical reasons, battle damage to hoists, or whatever. I recently heard that this was not the case, and these weapons could not share ammunition. What's the real story, and if they were truly incompatible, what was the reason for the proliferation of guns with exactly 127mm bore diameter? Now, in terms of shared ammunition it's sort of six of one half dozen of the other in as much as there were certain shells like the mark 35 anti-aircraft shell and the mark 25 illumination round that were shared between some of those guns but there were other marks of anti-aircraft shell um, illum illumination rounds common shells etc and high explosives that were not shared between various uh, 
guns, and for example, the five inch fifty one also had an AP shell. But there was so there, there was some crossover, but not all with um, ammunition types. Now, as for the reason of the proliferation of guns with exactly one twenty seven millimeter or five inch bore diameter, that comes down to the eternal question of ships' secondary batteries and later anti aircraft batteries. Um, that dominated pretty much the entirety of the late pre-dreadnought and dreadnought and even into the early aircraft carrier era, which is that when you start off this period, obviously aircraft aren't a threat, so we're talking about the 5-inch 51 caliber gun at this point. Now, when you're using the, a gun of this kind of caliber, you're talking about sort of something where between a 4 and a 6-inch gun as a secondary or possibly in dreadnought's a pre-dreadnought's tertiary battery, you're looking at using this as an anti-destroyer, anti-torpedo boat weapon. So you need it to be firing relatively rapidly. You need it to reach out a fairly long distance, because obviously you want to try and hit the torpedo boats before they get into torpedo range. But in order to fire rapidly, obviously the lighter the shell, the smaller the shell, the quicker you can load them, but also the less impact and effect it's going to have. So you have this dichotomy of a large shell, like say a six inch shell, is going to be much more likely to do serious damage or stop a destroyer in one or two hits. But if you can't fire them fast enough, you probably won't hit the thing before it launches torpedoes. Whereas if you use, say, a four inch gun, you're going to be able to lay down a blistering curtain of fire. But if you land a couple of hits, that's not necessarily going to stop your target. So where along that spectrum everybody sits in terms of um, what kind of gun they're going to go for varies from navy to navy but the other factor was that past a certain point the sheer weight of the shell becomes an issue um, so you can make a quick firing six inch gun but the weight of the six inch shell and its uh, charge is possibly going to be too heavy for a crew to sustain rapid fire and a lot of people ended up going for a kind of something in the 5-inch range. Um, so you see the, the British kind of creep up towards that. They go 4 in Well, in their Dreadnought uh, secondary batteries, they go from 4-inch to straight to 6-inch. But in terms of other things like destroyer guns, they go for 4.5, 4.7. They also try 5.2 and 5.5, although they can't make them work. Eventually, they end up with a 5.25 later on. Uh, for dual purpose but that's a little bit down the line of this development cycle but in the five inch caliber the u.s navy found what they thought was pretty much the perfect medium you could make a quick firing five inch gun the crews could load the five inch shells pretty much continuously um, at a fairly rapid rate and although it didn't have quite the stopping power of a six inch gun it had significantly more stopping power than a four inch gun and so they thought right this is great fantastic also, being a 5-inch gun, you could just about fit it onto destroyers um, when those started to come about as uh, larger ships. And it was also, albeit somewhat light, it was also a suitable armament for some cruisers. So this meant that the 5-inch 51 caliber weapon could be deployed across the US fleet as a common gun for anti-surface use, whether it be in battleships, cruisers, or destroyers. And that obviously led to massive commonality of parts, familiarization with the gun, and you could use a common ammunition stockpile. Now, pretty much the same concerns that you have when you're trying to shoot at a destroyer actually apply when uh, aircraft are invented and you're now trying to shoot at aircraft. You want a gun that you can load quickly, that can be fired quickly, and in the case of aircraft, if you well, obviously if you've got a shrapnel uh, anti-aircraft shell, you want it to have sufficient power to create a fairly large explosive um, blast area and the shrapnel to go out and kill aircraft. So again, you have the problem of uh, a heavier caliber gun would have individually the shells would blanket more airspace, but it will fire slower. And a lighter caliber weapon, you can fire a lot faster, but the individual shells won't take up as much volume. And this actually becomes significantly more important when you're shooting aircraft because of the 3D nature of uh, the explosive uh, shrapnel cloud that you're creating. And so for pretty much the same reasons that the 5-inch 51 was selected for anti-surface work, the 5-inch 25 was selected for anti-aircraft work. And the reason for the 25 caliber, because you might think, well, don't you want a 
really high velocity gun so you can reach out to the aircraft pretty quickly and reach quite high altitudes yes you do however the additional consideration for anti-aircraft guns is you need to be able to swivel them a lot faster because a torpedo boat or a destroyer might be moving at 30 to 35 knots on the surface and that may be pretty quick but even a late world war one era biplane is going to be moving at 150 200 miles an hour which is significantly faster and things only get faster from then on so a 51 caliber weapon is going to weigh considerably more and is going to be a lot slower to traverse which then means that you're not going to be able to keep up with aircraft and even if you make some kind of powered mount that can, it's going to have inertia, which means tracking the aircraft as it makes maneuvers to try and avoid your shells becomes more difficult and accuracy suffers as a result. Hence the selection of a shorter 25 caliber barrel. So then the 5 inch 25 became a widely proliferating anti-aircraft weapon, again, for pretty much similar commonality reasons, uh, whilst the 51 caliber stayed around as an anti-surface weapon. The sole disadvantage of the 25 caliber was that with its much shorter barrel, it had a considerably lower muzzle velocity, which meant that its uh, range and penetration capability against surface targets was considerably less. That's why they couldn't use it as a dual purpose weapon. In, you could, in theory, use a 25 caliber 5 inch gun against surface targets, but they'd have to be very close and pretty much unarmored. And then later a little bit later on still down the line enter the 5 inch 38 caliber the 38 caliber as you might be able to work out is near enough as makes no difference about halfway between the 25 and the 51 so it's got a higher muzzle velocity than the 25 which makes it more suitable for use against surface targets because yep the shell's going to reach further it's going to get there quicker and it's going to hit with more kinetic energy therefore it's actually going to stand a better chance of going through the side plates of destroyers and small cruisers but at the same time it's still not as heavy as the 51 caliber so it can traverse aim and track much better and with the advances in the ways of traversing and aiming guns or power control hydraulics uh, etc depending on the ship in question the 38 could maneuver pretty much as easily as a 25 albeit obviously it did need a little bit more assistance to do so and because of those increased characteristics in ballistic performance, it meant that it could reach out and hit aircraft that were further away, and it could obviously be a lot more accurate as well. So with its ability to take on surface targets acceptably, as well as engage aircraft targets very well, it became an ideal dual purpose weapon. Because at the end of the day, between the early 1900s and the 1930s-1940s, humans, who were still the loaders of these weapons, hadn't really changed, so those sort of basic criteria of can the crew handle the shells and charges quickly enough and for long enough to not get fatigued and start making mistakes still applied. So why change things? And as we said, there was a certain degree of ammunition interoperability as well. So that all of that factored in, plus... US designers by this point were pretty good at estimating exactly how much space and weight you needed to allocate for a 5 inch mount so by not going away from that particularly it allowed you to pretty easily work out what the secondary battery of a new ship should be and of course by having the 38 caliber 5 inch weapon it meant that as opposed to some of the earlier standard class where they'd had to reduce the 5 inch anti-surface battery to include 5 inch anti-aircraft guns and ended up with a relatively small battery of anti-surface weapons and a relatively small battery of anti-aircraft weapons they could instead mount more of a single unified 5 inch 38 battery which meant that you actually had more guns available for both roles even though the total number of guns aboard was less. So, for example, at the time of her destruction, the USS Arizona had had her 5-inch 51 caliber battery reduced to 12 guns and was also carrying eight 25 caliber 5-inch guns. So she had a total of 20 5-inch guns, but the anti-aircraft battery on any given side would have been four guns and the anti-surface battery on any given side would have been six guns. 
But then you look at something like USS North Carolina, which is a significantly larger ship, displacing over 6,000 tons more than the Arizona, and it has, in this particular case, the same number of 5-inch guns at 20, but being that they're all 5-inch 38 gun uh, caliber guns, it means that the anti-aircraft broadside is 10 guns, and the anti-surface broadside is also 10 guns. So same number of guns, much larger ship, um, but considerably greater anti-aircraft and anti-surface um, broadside battery, which of course means that proportionally there's more weight saved for other things on the ship, such as main guns and armor. Or you could look at USS South Dakota, which was obviously built after the North Carolinas, and because of her fittings as a flagship, she only carried 16 uh, five-inch guns, uh, again, but in uh, the twin mounts, but even then, eight guns for anti-aircraft work or eight guns for anti-surface work on each broadside is still better than the six and four on the Arizona, despite the fact there's four fewer guns. So hopefully that clears up some of the questions around the US five-inch guns. The Hand of Ray asks, did the Royal Navy have any new plans for battle cruisers in the 1930s and 1940s after the cancelled G3 design? So yes, in fact they did. Uh, well, whilst the Washington Naval Conference was going on, uh, having recognised that the lim weight limit was going to be dropped to 35,000 tonnes, they already prepared a pair of designs labelled F2 and F3. Um, now, you can probably see, hopefully from the picture showing up at the moment, that F2 and F3 kind of resemble battlecruiser versions of the Nelson, and they were basically a combination of G3 and Nelson-class design um, lineages. Specifically, the Royal Navy did not want to sacrifice protection in any way, shape, or form, so both of these ships actually carried the, pretty much the same armour protection as the G3, which to a certain degree makes them kind of a mockery when it comes to battle cruisers, because, well, the G3s as design carried more protection than, well, most battleships at the time, and indeed most battleships even into World War II, but never mind. They call them battle cruisers, so that's what they were. So how did they achieve this level of protection on about 10,000 tons less? Well, they dropped the speed slightly. Um, from F2 dropped the speed from 33 to 32 to 33 knots to 29 to 30 knots, and they also dropped the armament dramatically. On F2, it was three twin 15-inch guns, so pretty much the same kind of uh, armament as the renowned class battle cruisers. And then on F3, they upgraded it to nine 15-inch guns, going with three triple turrets, except that they still didn't want to compromise on protection, so to squeeze that into 35,000 tons, they dropped the speed by a knot, so 28 to 29 knots. And in fact, F3 would go on to influence the final layout of the Nelsons. Then in the late 1920s, when it was considered that the displacement limit might be dropped even further, there were designs prepared armed with 12-inch guns only, and there was a battle cruiser design at 28,000 tons, capable of 30 knots, that carried six 12-inch guns. Basically, it was a miniature renown um, with... Uh, two twin turrets forward super firing and one twin turret aft. Then in the early 1930s, partially in response to the advent of the Deutschland class in Germany and the Dunkirk class in France, they prepared a whole series of sketch designs uh, ranging between 21 and 26,000 tonnes with a minimum armament of three twin 12 inch and a maximum armament of four twin 13.5 inch, uh, the latter being effectively uh, not in layout, but certainly in concept, effectively modernised, updated versions of the Lion and Tiger class of battle cruisers, all capable of 30 knots. And that was pretty much the end of that. I mean, there were various arguments going back and forth as to what the design that eventually evolved into the King George V as to whether or not it was a particularly fast battleship or a slightly slower battle cruiser, and there are some documents that refer to Vanguard as a fully armoured battle cruiser, um, but by the latter part of the 1930s, the kind of everything had just merged together into the fast battleship design. Michael Jones asks, The post-treaty Baltimore-class cruisers grew significantly in their displacement, but their main battery remained the same as the previous Wichita class. 
It even had less guns than some of the older Pensacola class and some of the Japanese heavy cruisers. With the end of treaty limitations, were there any plans to give them larger or more main battery guns? Uh, or could they have done a Megami Shan horse trick and replaced them with a twin turret with uh, two of the Mark 8 12-inch guns replacing the 8-inch triples? And with this, would you have a cruiser killer without having to resort to the huge Alaskas? So you might well ask, after all, the uh, Baltimore class is about 50% heavier than either the Pensacola or the Wichita, but it still only has the nine guns, and it's not like the Des Moines, where you've got the nine auto-loading eight-inch guns. They are near enough as make some difference, the same triple eight-inch guns as on um, the Wichita. So, where did all that extra displacement go? Well, it the ship itself is physically larger, it's uh, 673 feet and change compared to which is 608 feet, so there's more of it. With there being more ship, that means you need more power. So both Wichita and Baltimore can make 33 knots, but Wichita needs another 20,000 shaft horsepower, so that's a 20% increase in power output, which obviously means more machinery, um, which obviously is going to add to weight before you can even begin to touch the armament. Armour-wise, Wichita and Baltimore are similar. Their armour layouts aren't identical, and the armour thicknesses are also not exactly the same, but they're pretty similar, and obviously using the same guns, that part is very similar. So the displacement hasn't gone into armament, so you might be thinking, well, do that increase in dimensions, is that the sole reason the displacement's gone up by uh, nearly 5,000 tonnes? No, not quite, because you've got to remember two things. Um, one, especially compared to the Pensacola's, is obviously uh, they're using triple turrets rather than triples and twins. But also, you've got the advance in technology. Now, that comes in two forms, electronics and anti-air. So there's an awful lot more electronics on a Baltimore than there is on Wichita in terms of radar, radios, etc., etc. So that is going to significantly... Um, affect a ship's weight and especially its top weight. I mean that doesn't affect the overall displacement but it does affect it does affect the stability of the ship um, so you have to take that into account and that probably accounts for quite quite a fair bit because the Baltimores were quite quite the uh, electronic equipped uh, vessels. You've also then got to take into account the anti-aircraft <laughs> battery. Um, the AA battery, comparatively, is quite a bit heavier. So Wichita, its secondary battery is 8 5-inch 38 guns. And these 8 guns are placed in a variety of open and, open and enclosed single mounts, whereas uh, Baltimore carries no less than 12, so you've got a 50% increase in 5-inch uh, guns, and they're all in the twin mounts, which obviously weigh a bit more than the single mounts in and of themselves. So there's an increase in weight there from the anti-aircraft battery, but also the lighter anti-aircraft battery. And bear in mind, this is not just about the guns. If you increase the anti-aircraft battery, that means you've also got more men, you've got more ammunition, you've got to have the accommodation space and all the other ancillary stuff that goes into keeping the crew fed and alive. So this is all going to add up to extra weight, and at the sort of end of the war, Wichita is going to be displacing more than it did initially, but even then it has 24, 40mm and 18, 20mm, whereas the Baltimore has 48, 40mm and 24, 20mm. So it's got slightly more 20mm and twice as many 40mm guns. So all of that weight adds up, and as I said, all the wet crew, etc. adds up as well. So Baltimore's total complement is ostensibly, before any upgrades and refits, etc., 61 officers, 1,085 sailors. So you're looking at just over 1,100 total, whereas Wichita's in, uh, total crew complement is 929. So you've got over 150 more um, officers and men to accommodate, and obviously that's going to add weight as well. So hopefully that gives you a short summation as to why the Baltimore class weighs so much. 
when their armour and armament don't actually increase all that much. It's basically they're bigger ships, they've got more men on board, and they have a significantly heavy anti-aircraft battery. Colonel Overkill asks, Hypothetical engagement post-World War II still using big gun warships. If aircraft and anti-ship missiles are taken out of the picture, what do you think the future of naval artillery combat would have looked like? And secondly, in this scenario, ignoring political considerations, do you think shells like the Mark 23 16-inch or smaller nuclear shells fired as a subcaliber shot could be practical, or would the blast effect and radiation of even smaller shells be too hazardous to employ in continuous fighting? Well, this is slightly different to the uh, question in a previous dry dock about if uh, missile technology was delayed, because that still had aircraft around. So if we're taking aircraft and missiles out of the equation and just looking purely at surface-to-surface -surface gun actions, um, the single biggest evolution will be the increasing use of automatic fire, um, automatically fed guns. So obviously you can see the Worcester here. So you had Worcester and Des Moines in the US showing that um, extremely high rates of uh, automatic firing 6-inch and 8-inch guns were possible. The British were slightly behind, but they were working on their own twin 6-inch rapid-fire weapons, as would eventually be shown in the Tiger class, but would have could have been deployed at that point um, earlier on the actual Minotaur-class design. So cruiser engagements would get very interesting. Um, I think in actual fact it's entirely possible that in the, that kind of circumstance the destroyer could well have found itself rendered obsolete. Um, or else it would have to grow into something the size of a small cruiser like a Dido or an Atlanta to survive, because there is a certain upper limit to how fast you can get a heavy naval gun to fire, and whilst rapid firing a destroyer guns in sort of four and a half and five inch calibers did exist um, and would continue to exist, the simple fact of the matter is if you've got something like a Worcester, a Minotaur, or a Des Moines, those ships are going to be armoured to be able to resist a significant amount of that smaller calibre gunfire. And, well, do you really want to be on the receiving end of a Minotaur or a Worcester that's just gone full ham against your destroyer with multiple rapid-fire six-inch guns? Don't think so, really. Um, so that you might well have seen the extinction of the destroyer uh, as we know it, as I said. Um, plus... As some of you will know, the Royal Navy was kind of looking at a possibility of an automatically loaded 16-inch variant for HMS Lion. Now, I think with that bringing us onto the battleships, the 16-inch calibre will probably still remain for a while. Um, as as I've discussed before, practically speaking and realistically, that's about the largest you can comfortably go to on a battleship um, without some significant drop off somewhere else you can kind of just about go 18 but if you're going to go twin 18 versus a good triple 16 it's a, it's a little bit of swings and roundabouts at that point um, because your ability to fire relatively rapidly and also just the sheer mechanics of traversing such monstrous weapons uh, thanks to the square cube law starts to edge out of the realms of practicality. You just have to look at the sheer size and slow training rate of uh, Yamato's turrets to see that in action. So I think the 16-inch gun would remain probably the battleship caliber weapon of choice for a while. Um, there would probably be investment in expanding the automatic firing, obviously having gone from the 6-inch to the 8-inch, and probably then looking into getting a an automatic firing 16 inch turret which would be a, an interesting scenario to say the least now the only thing that would probably then cause a much later shift would be that once you're able to effectively drown your enemy in 16 inch gunfire that would probably start pushing a shift towards um, ever increasing armour thicknesses as is usually the case with arms races and as we know from some of the 1945 battleship designs in the Royal Navy, they were prepared to consider absolutely monstrous ships, absolutely slathered in armour, carrying 16-inch guns. Now at the time, that was a reaction to, can we actually make a ship that can withstand incoming aerial threats, bombs, rockets, etc., early missiles. But it does show that the principle 
at least exists on paper, if not necessarily easily constructed in reality. But if a ship of that nature was built, then you could plaster it in 16-inch gunfire, but the core elements of the ship might still remain, which then might force uh, an escalation to an 18-inch gun caliber at some point. David C. Warthen says, I saw the new movie Midway today. I enjoyed it. If you see it, I'd be interested to hear your observations of it, both in general and in terms of its historical accuracy or inaccuracy. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, as um, <laughs> there's been a number of uh, opinions expressed on the various uh, social media platforms by various people um, who are also interested in naval history about the movie, um, I was not able to... Uh, get the time to go and see the Midway movie while it was out in the UK cinemas. So, very sorry about that, uh, David C. Warthen, but if you uh, keep a track on when the thing's released on DVD, um, then pop that question in again, and uh, I will do my best to answer it for you. Moon Gara asks, How would it have affected the Mediterranean theatre in the Second World War if the Italians had gotten the Libyan oil fields up and running in the 1930s? Well, it certainly would have helped the Italians in the run-up to the war, as they would have been able to stockpile a lot more fuel. Um, however, in terms of helping them in the overall conduct of World War II, it might actually be significantly less useful than you think. And that's mainly because of the location. If you look at where these oil fields actually are and where their main ports for export are, obviously this is a much more modern map, but the oil's not going anywhere. Now you look at a map of Operation Compass, the main British attack against the Italians that uh, cut off most of the Italian 10th Army, and you notice that basically, well, to brook falling and the extent of the advance means that most of the output of the major fields either has the output terminals now firmly in British hands or very close to the front lines. Now, if the British capture those intact, that means the British have a bunch of oil. Um, if they don't, because the Italians blow them up, then, well, neither side has the oil, but that's kind of back to square one, really. Um, and the few, um, the, the fewer extraction points just to the west of this area would obviously be priority targets for the RAF and possibly even the Royal Navy. There is obviously the, the westernmost field, which would provide some output, which would help, but again, you've got to get that back across to Italy um, in the face of opposition. Now, obviously, when Rommel comes and counterattacks, this whole area is going to get uh, fought over again, and you can guarantee if there are any um, oil feeder points, etc., that the British uh, have captured, assuming that the Italians didn't blow them up, the British definitely will demolish them on the way back out. Um, so more than likely is that by the end of 1941, pretty much all the oil extraction infrastructure has either been deliberately blown up by the people falling back from it, whether that be Italians or British, or has been bombed to pieces or shelled to pieces, um, with the only possible exception being that western field right at the outer edge. Um, and that obviously will still, as we said, have the problems of trying to get the tankers back to Italy. So it'll have a small effect, at the small to medium effect at the beginning, um, but that effect will rapidly peter out, and then it's going to come down to, I think at the end of it, it I mean, there'll be some advantage to Rommel in as much as there'll be some additional oil available to him, which will slightly decom uh, decomplicate his log logistics, but at the end of the day, you've still got to refine the thing. So it's going to depend where are the refineries. Are the refineries placed on the Libyan coastline, in which case they're vulnerable to attack, but they can provide fuel directly to Rommel and the Italians, or other refineries back in Italy where they're slightly harder to attack, but then you've got to ship the thing, the oil all the way across to Italy, and then you've got to ship the finished products back again. And, well, um, when the Germans converted a couple of their gigantic gliders into flow, flying uh, fuel stores, didn't tend to go very well, because when a bunch of bow fighters come and shoot up what's effectively a gigantic multi-ton flying petrol tank, yeah, it, things burn very, very easily. And then, of course, you also have the fact that if these oil fields are still extant uh, by the late 42, early 43, by the time the access gets kicked out of North Africa and eventually then Italy obviously uh, surrenders, 
well, the Allies now have a relatively convenient source of oil next to them. Again, the refineries being the major question. Paul from Chicago asks, is U-35 the most successful vessel of all time? So U-35 was a German U-boat, unsurprisingly, in World War One that had the rather unusual distinction of being in commission near enough, as makes no difference, at the start of World War One, and surviving the entire war, as well as the commander also surviving the entire war, uh, which, given the uh, rate of fatality amongst German U-boats and their crews, is a pretty significant feat. And they were especially skilled as their... They managed, well, the U-35, and mostly with one commander aboard, um, eventually managed to put down over half a million tonnes of Allied shipping, uh, which does make it the highest scoring submarine of all time by a considerable margin. So I think objectively, in terms of highest amount of tonnage sunk, you could definitely put U-35 comfortably at the top of that tree. Um, although, when it comes down to most successful vessel of all time, at the end of the day, U-35 did not help its country to win the war, so you could count that against it. I mean, there, there are various ways of, of judging most successful uh, vessel of all time. As I say, if you if you want to judge it by gross tonnage sunk, then, yep, yeah, fine, U-35, easy winner. Um, you could also, I suppose, make arguments about uh, most successful as in largest tonnage of enemy warships sunk. Um that that would be a category uh, that could be explored further, or possibly most revenue earned by a warship, in which case you, well, you're almost certainly going to have to go back to the age of sail um, and the various prizes that those ships used to take, at which point I think the Indefatigable is probably in the running um, quite comfortably there. So, yeah, hopefully that answers that. Anton Geistlitz, I think. Uh, I have no idea how... I can't remember from my German class how you pronounce that weird SB shape in German. Anyway, sorry. Um, it asks, what was the last battle between warships of two nations that only used gunfire and where one side managed to sink a ship of the other side? The latest I could find was the naval battle of Mugao Harbour in 1961, where three Indian frigates shelled a Portuguese sloop, causing it to be beached and abandoned. So it depends how you define warship. Uh, there were a number of North Vietnamese boats, I guess, um, that were on the receiving end of 5-inch and 16-inch gunfire from various Iowa-class battleships during the Vietnam War, which would have post-dated that particular incident. But the in terms of uh, the last artillery sinking of a ship, it's... Possibly, and I do put a big question mark over this because there are conflicting reports, but possibly in the 2008 war between Russia and Georgia, as there is a report that, well, we know that there was a skirmish between vessels of the Georgian Navy and vessels of the Russian Navy. The difference in the analysis is that some reports indicate that the Russian units opened fire with their deck guns and sunk a Georgian uh, boat whereas other sources claim that the Russians opened fire using a surface-to-surface -surface missile, which would then obviously go on to sink the Georgian boat. So it depends on which of those reports you believe. If Obviously, if it's a missile, then it's not, but if you believe the gun version of the story, then in theory that would have been the last gun action of uh, surface combat, at least for now. Colonel Cheng asks, I realise you would prefer not to discuss post-Cold War technology, so this is admittedly slightly above your Cold War cut-off date, but please indulge me. A Blackstone Fortress versus a Necron World Engine, who wins? Okay, fine. I'm going to go with the Blackstone Fortress on the basis that, well, the Necron World Engine was surrounded for days by an Imperial fleet and didn't manage to kill all of them, or nearly all of them, and could be invaded in a surface action, whereas we've established <coughs> in more recent lore that uh, fully activated Blackstone Fortress can get rid of pretty much anyone who invades it if it really wants to, and, well, it's got those gigantic warp cannons, and, well, the Necrons, if they're vulnerable to anything, they're vulnerable to gigantic warp cannons. So I have a feeling a Blackstone Fortress will probably um, total a world engine. NCC8472 asks, How would the outcome of the Battle of Midway change if the following were true? Saratoga finishes repairs early, 
Shikaku, Zuikaku and Lexington leave Coral Sea unscathed, including their air groups, and all four carriers participate in the Battle of Midway on their respective sides. For this encounter, we hypothesise the two forces never end up encountering each other at Coral Sea due to poor recon, and the planned Japanese invasion of Port Moresby fails due to some sort of weather anomaly. What repercussions would this have for the remainder of the war for either side? So this is a bit of an interesting one. So you basically have the six Japanese fleet carriers versus, well, the entirety of the useful American fleet carriers bar Wasp. So how's this going to go about? I think, see, the thing with the Battle of Midway is it's dependent so much on luck. Um, you have, sort of, on paper, the Japanese have an advantage um, in the original Battle of Midway, but it's completely turned around by the arrival of those two dive bomber units from two completely separate ships, um, launched at completely separate times, looking for completely separate targets, but both, by sheer luck, happen to show up at just the right time when the Japanese combat air patrol is um, a little bit distracted. Now, you can argue, hypothetically expanding on that, multiple different things. I mean, with Shikaku and Zuikaku there as well with full air groups, it's entirely possible that that um, sort of confluence of dive bombers doesn't make anywhere near the difference that it does historically, because there might be more combat air patrol up, which might intercept them and break up that attack formation, which then means that the Japanese still have an advantage in overall numbers um, and aircraft, etc. But then, on the other hand, sheer happenstance it might not happen if, um, if Shikaku and Zuikaku are deployed on the wrong side. Um, of Akagi and Kaga for that particular circumstance, then that might not happen and they, you might still get sunk. Um, but then the Counter-Strike might still be heavier. Um, Lexington and Saratoga are quite big, but as Lexington point showed um, at Coral Sea, there were some issues with her manoeuvrability because uh, as compared to battle cruisers, they weren't particularly agile. Yorktown's still damaged. Um, it, yeah, it, 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 it's hard to tell because, as I said already, Midway went the way it did on partly on the basis of luck. Um, obviously, the Americans do have the advantage they can read the Japanese codes. Um, <laughs> so they're going with initial starting advantage, possibly countered by the fact the Japanese have more aircraft. Now, obviously, historically, the Japanese attacks did take quite significant losses, but then with two extra carriers, they might have the aircraft to coordinate even larger strike waves. Personally, on paper, I would give the Japanese a slightly greater advantage, um, as well as not a slightly higher chance of victory, maybe like 55, 45, or 60, 40. And I say that purely because, well, as demonstrated by the uh, arrival and then destruction of the devastated torpedo bomber squadrons, and then the two dive bomber squadrons showing up completely separately at random. The American method of carrier attack at this point wasn't exactly a sort of a coherent mass strike. The Japanese were slightly better at that point in the war in carrying out um, a combined sort of a, well for an well what counts of aircraft a combined arms strike by dive bombers and torpedo bombers, and so with the larger air groups that they will have as a result of having two extra fleet carriers, there's a chance that such an attack might swamp the American defences on a carrier or or more than one carrier since they are operating relatively independently. And once carrier hulls start going under and the air groups obviously then have to disperse to other carriers, then efficiency starts to drop and it kind of becomes a rolling um escalation from there, which is pretty much what happened to the Japanese in uh, historically. But, as I say, one lucky turn of the dice and that could flip round entirely. Uh, but, in terms of overall repercussions, with the sheer numbers of carriers and the number of aircraft that are present, it's probably going to have a much, much bigger impact on the war for the next year or two, which, whichever way it goes, because unless one of the two admirals decides to cut losses and run, it's fairly likely that whoever wins is going to achieve a near total wipeout of the other side um, because of that snowball effect. And the Japanese losing 
the four carries they did at midway was bad enough. If they lose Shikaku and Zuikaku as well at, me at that point, well, they're, they're in even more trouble than they were historically. Whereas if the Americans managed to lose um, the three Yorktowns plus the two Lexingtons, they're down to Wasp and Ranger, and Ranger was not really not really capable of of operating um, in the same way that all the other fleet carriers were, and Wasp also was a fairly uh, downsized ship. So it could have some fairly serious implications for things like Guadalcanal, Wake Island, Midway, etc. going forward, um, although obviously inevitably by late 1943 the Essexes would be showing up anyway. Memori asks, if Frederick III's treatment was successful and he lived out his life as emperor, what do you think the, an eventual world war would look like? For example, would they still be hostile with the British? How would a more gradual build-up of military and civilian naval infrastructure impact the high seas fleet versus anyone else, possible colonies, etc.? Well, the interesting thing is that at the time of Frederick III's death, um, and actually for a good portion of Wilhelm II's reign, Germany and Britain were actually relatively close. Uh, France and Russia, ironically enough ending up being as Britain's allies in the First World War, were seen as Britain's natural enemies and competitors. And it was Wilhelm II who was absolutely obsessed with having a big navy, and he was the one who pretty much single-handedly drove the British away from the uh, the alliance that they had, and they ended up obviously viewing him as a threat, which led... Um, to the side the British took in the First World War. Um, and he really had to work hard to turn that around. Um, so, yeah, if if he is left to sort of play motorboats, etc., while his father continues uh, to reign, then it's much more likely that the German ties with the UK are going to be maintained uh, much more closely. Germany will probably pick up fewer colonies overseas because, yeah, again, le less of an obsession with the, uh, the whole naval side of things. Although there will be colonialism because inevitably that is what European countries in the late 19th century do. Um, the high seas fleet, therefore, would likely be considerably smaller. Um, it would have its coast defence ships. But if they're continuing a sort of a semi-alliance and friendly relations with Britain, they're probably going to see the Royal Navy as the main counterweight against the Russian and French fleets. And so the high seas aspect of the high seas fleet is much more likely to be um, sort of armoured cruisers and protected cruisers for commerce protection, showing the flag, leading foreign squadrons, etc. Um, with perhaps a small battle fleet corps to um, help them in, well, probably to help the Royal Navy out in any potential hypothetical war with France or Russia, and so that they've got something impressive to show around the world. So maybe eight or eight or half, eight or a dozen pre-dreadnoughts, and then when the dreadnought uh, race kicks off, their Germans. Well, there probably won't be a dreadnought race because the Germans won't have any particular motivation to follow suit. But maybe around about the nineteen tens, nineteen era. The German Navy, the High Seas Fleet, might be might be carrying sort of six to eight, maybe slightly more dreadnoughts, um, but it it won't have sparked this massive building rush because they won't they they'll be seen as sort of allied assets with the Royal Navy. Now the big question, of course, is what happens with World War One? The the Balkans are going to kick off one way or the other because none of this affects how. Austria-Hungary and its relationship with the Balkans uh, are going to go. On the other hand, um, although he he did join the army, Frederick is well. He, if he lasts through to 1914 or that kind of period, he is not going to be particularly enamoured with the idea of giving or appearing to give Austria-Hungary a blank check, which means that and it, and to be honest, if even if he passes away in the 1900s and Wilhelm takes over, the the German navy building effort will still be significantly less. So even if he wants to ramp it up immediately, he's not going to be anywhere close to the same kind of tension and uh, threat that the Royal Navy perceived him as, as historically. But assuming that Frederick's still around, he'll be an old man, but he's not going to want to start a war there, which means that Austria-Hungary will probably have to settle for something a little bit more reasonable when it comes to dealing with Serbia, 
which might damp down that potential conflict there and then. Um, there might be a limited war of some description, but it's not likely to drag everybody else into things. The interesting thing is that, as a lot of historians have said, in one way or another, some kind of world war was probably going to break out at some point. But quite what feature, that, what kind of um, elements that would involve, given the alternate circumstances, is very hard to measure. Uh, Queen Victoria's plan of marrying her children off to practically everybody in Europe in order to uh, make it harder to go to war ki had kind of worked, but not entirely, obviously. Um, and the British and the French, even whilst they were gradually being almost forced into an alliance by the uh, conduct of Wilhelm II historically, they still had a number of flashpoints. Um, so... It's it's difficult to tell what a potential world war would have looked like. It, it the the logical thing would be Germany and Britain versus France and Russia, but I can't see France and Russia being dumb enough to start that fight. It's certainly not in the nineteen tens dash nineteen early twenties. Uh, but then again, without World War One breaking out the way it did, America, obviously with its great white fleet and then its ambitions to have a larger battle fleet might get somehow involved, be the trigger, or some such. But then again, America will have less money because they're not being funded by everybody else in World War One, and Congress is probably still going to be trying to just slowly strangle the US Navy to death, so who knows what could be going there. I mean, I, I genuinely couldn't tell you at that point. There's so many different scenarios. But it probably would, it would almost certainly mean World War One as we know it didn't happen. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, Much has been discussed about the angle at which a shell hits the armoured belt of a ship. Uh, a shell fired at short range hits the belt relatively flat on, whereas a shell fired at a distance strikes the belt at an arc or angle, effectively giving the belt greater thickness to stop the shell. Yet I don't think I've ever heard mention of a factor that I think would have an even greater impact, the angle of the attacking ship. For example, my understanding is that Hood was attempting to close the distance on Bismarck and thus approached at quite an angle. Wouldn't this angle of attack have effectively increased the stopping power of Hood's belt? Have ships attacked angles to attempt to increase the stopping power of their armoured belt? Ah uh, yes, this is uh, what's basically known in World of Warships as bow tanking, um, which in and of itself, World of Warships bow tanking is pretty unhistorical, unhistorical. but the idea of angling your belt um, in this manner to increase the apparent thickness of it, it does have an effect, it definitely does. Um, however, the reason it's not discussed so much is that, generally speaking, for the majority of a gun battle, most ships would be at near enough bro on broadside angles or close enough to it that it didn't make much odds um, in order to assist in their gunfire solutions being better. So you might remember from a previous Stridoc when we were talking about the sheer complexity of fire control solutions and how difficult those were to calculate. This is part of the reason. Um, basically, well, one, if you've got ships with four and a half turrets, if you turn in too much, obviously you mask your rear turrets, which reduces your overall firepower. Um, two, as we said, actual bow tanking is not a thing, and you risk then having big holes blown out of your bow, which is bad. But also, when you are closing, so let's say you're closing at a 30, 45 degree angle, bearing in mind what we were talking about fire control solutions before, you are now introducing extra dimensions to the difficulty of your fire control, because you have if you're if you're sailing broadside to broadside um assuming that you're at roughly the same speed you've only got to account for that forward momentum range isn't going to change bearing isn't going to change that you've basically just got to lead a lead deflection shot that factors in your speed and their speed if you are traveling at a different speed then obviously that changes the calculation somewhat if you turn towards them now the rate of closure is changing, so you've got to now account for at the fact that the elevation of your guns is going to be constantly changing, and you've got to factor in that there is now a horizontal component, uh, well, on, there is, there's now two horizontal components to your apparent velocity, and thus the change of rate and bearing to the enemy, because you're closing on them as well as either 
if you're going much faster than them, still overhauling them, possibly staying on the same bearing, possibly falling back, most likely falling back, relatively speaking. Um, because you've got more distance to cover. So it makes your fire control solutions much harder and therefore drops your accuracy off. Whereas for your enemy, if your enemy is just sort of sitting there happily cruising along broadside, they're for fire control purposes relatively static they've only got to account for their own forward speed um so they can take your course speed and bearing and then just start adjusting um their shots so basically plowing in it can offer you certain advantages at the end of it but it is a risky approach in and of itself because it makes your own targeting solution harder for that period uh, is what basically the summary of all that and there is also the fact that what angle you do this at is uh, quite uh, it's, it makes quite a bit of a difference uh, because what you're effectively doing is you're creating a triangle um, and you've got your thickness of uh, belt armor which will be one side of your right angle triangle and then you're creating the hypotenuse of a triangle by the angle that you're turning that belt armor and then the increase in apparent thickness uh, is a result of, of that, because the hypotenuse is obviously longer than the baseline. Basic mathematics. Oh, but at relatively shallow angles, that doesn't make too much of a difference. So, for example, if you're, at, uh, if you, if you're turned 10 degrees from perpendicular, the multiplier is only 1.02. If you're turned 20 degrees from perpendicular, the multiplier is only 1.06. But then as, well, because this is all following a sine curve, so if you then turn 30 degrees from the perpendicular, suddenly the multiplier jumps to 1.15. And when you're talking in terms of relative thicknesses of armour, then at 1.15, you may be adding a sort of a couple of inches effective thickness to your armour, but then you're turned at 30 degrees, which is almost the limit of a lot of rear turrets at angles of forward fire. And if you go up to 40 degrees now, you've got a 1.31 multiplier, so that's probably 3.5 to 4 inches increased thickness. Now, that's a substantial amount, but if you're turned at 40 degrees, chances are you've masked at least one of your rear turrets. Um, and that leads to the other problem, which is in terms of absolute overall calculation... Um, you've now created, rather than a 2D triangle, you've got a 3D triangle because you've got the angle of your ship relative to the other ship and the angle of fall of the shell. So you now, to work out the overall effective thickness, it's going to be a bit more than that as a multiplier because obviously um, you've now got the 3D triangle. But effectively what it comes down to is that in order to get a substantially substantial increase in uh, protection by angling your ship, you have to turn in such a way that you are probably going to throw out your own fire control solutions or make them a lot harder, and you're probably going to mask your turrets. Because the whole World of Warships thing of, uh, oh, I'm going to angle myself almost 90 degrees in, just a little bit off, and then I'm going to quickly kick my back out so I can uh, fire my rear turret and then swing back in, doesn't work like that in real life, The at least in World War One, World War Two periods. By changing your speed and angle of bearing like that, you have basically just reset all your fire control <laughs> calculations, so you're not going to hit anything uh, if you're just doing that kind of wiggle. Jack Ace asks, we constantly hear about Allied code-breaking efforts and how it influenced World War II battles at sea. Could you talk about the Axis code-breaking efforts during the war? I've read little about them, so I defer to you on specifics, but what about effectiveness and results? So the main difference was between the Axis and Allied um, efforts in code breaking were that primarily that the Allies, certainly the British, very quickly s decided that they were going to have a central code breaking and intelligence division that would try and uh, break as many enemy codes as possible. Whereas, well, as you can imagine in the Japanese <laughs> military, the army and the navy were very definitely going to have their own code-breaking forces and they were not going to talk to each other in any way, shape or form. Uh, meanwhile, the Germans had uh, cryptanalysis um, teams for virtually every department and sub-department of the three main branches of the armed forces. So uh, at one point there were 13 different cryptanalysis departments, all of which obviously operating on significantly less 
individual funding and with much narrower focus than a single unified organization would have. And this obviously severely affected their overall effectiveness. With that said, they did have some success, particularly the German Navy's code-breaking department managed to crack quite a number of British and American codes in the early to mid part of the war. Now, they weren't entirely successful at reading everything because the vast majority of the codes that they managed to break were codes that were changed every month and it took them a week or two to break the new coding, which meant that well, that you'd have a backlog, so for sort of live feed stuff, you don't tend to have maybe about half the time they'd know some of the live feed signal information, um, and the other half of the time it was on a monthly basis, it was only really the really useful for picking up on long-term trends. So say if a, a convoy had been ordered to change course and hold that course for the next week or two, that might be useful, but if a convoy had been ordered, or a warship had been ordered to change course um, as a result of a specific threat that had been identified or specific mission that they were carrying out that was only going to last a few days by the time they were able to find out what was going on if that had happened in the first half of the month that would have, the operation would already have happened um, but this sort of back and forth ping pong went on for quite a while um, until in the late 1942 early 1943 period um, allied coding stepped up a notch and then they, the Germans found themselves no longer able to decode anything of significant strategic importance. That said, what they did manage to decipher did prove quite important at certain times, so the breaking of certain codes allowed the... Uh, well, enhanced the success of the U-boat attacks against the American East Coast shortly after America entered the war. Um, it also informed the final planning for the German assault on Crete um, and a number of other operations. On the Japanese side, there wasn't anywhere near as much success. Um, the Japanese did manage to crack a number of diplomatic codes, and the Germans gave them a copy of a merchant uh, shipping uh, code. So that allowed them to get some information, but one, they tended to ignore it. Two, some of the uh, more important codes that were broken were broken by the Japanese army, who of course refused to tell the navy about it. And at the end of the day, they weren't able to crack any important military codes like the Germans were, so they were left much, much worse off when it came to signals intelligence. And finally, Federico Bozzi asks, Could you tell us more about the practical gunnery range, uh, if I remember around 24,000 metres, and rate of fire, one salvo per minute for World War II battleships, Additionally, was the supercharge for 15-inch 42 caliber guns tested for accuracy? So in terms of the 15-inch 42 supercharge, I'm not aware of offhand of any specific tests to see if it, the, it had a particular effect on accuracy or not. Um, or I suppose I could look into that further. But the fact that they were issued and were used in certain ships and certain um, coastal fortifications without anyone raising some major issues over it, would indicate to me that it probably didn't have much, if any, effect on overall accuracy. Now, in terms of practical battle range and rate of fire, well, the two kind of go hand in hand because it's in part dictated by the time of flight of the shells. So, I've said in various videos that I consider the practical battle range of World War II era capital ships to be around about at its maximum around the 22 to 26,000 yard bracket and anything really much beyond that is not really worth considering um, and I've, illumin I've illuminated? No, I've elucidated further on that in other dry docks but basically what it comes down to is one the cumulative errors that then lead to drops in accuracy that much above that range, generally speaking, um, seem to be significant enough that the, the chances of hitting anything are so remote that even if you theoretically can, it's not worth trying. Um, because, and that's assuming a, a relatively static and or target or a target that's moving in a known course and speed, um, simply because th there's too many environmental factors in the way. Uh, coupled into that is, as I've mentioned before, is the fact that 
realistically speaking, when you're talking of shelf light times up to sort of 30,000 yards plus, an enemy who is watching you, which you type a competent enemy would do, can, by sheer mathematical logic, evade any salvo you throw at them, because assuming a ship can move at 25 to 30 knots, and the captain's on his toes, the flight time of shells from your ship to a target that's 30,000 plus yards away is simply so long that if they steer one way or the other, um, port or starboard, they will have moved out of the dispersion range of your shells by the time those shells arrive. And so, assuming that your fire solution was accurate, you're not going to hit them because they're not going to be where you aimed. And there's nothing you can do about that, because once the shells leave your guns, you have no control over where they're going. They're, they're going where you aimed them, roughly, you'd hope, um, and the enemy can just choose not to be there. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's luck involved, obviously. if the, Let's say you're, you're, the enemy turns to port, and that turns them towards you, and it turns out you've actually um, made an error in your calculations, and you shoot short, um, both uh, vert in sort of the distance element and the horizontal movement element, you might score a hit by sheer luck, but you don't win battles by counting on that level of rolling multiple natural 20s in a row. So, and, and in actual fact, this is more present when it comes to things like the Iowa firing the super heavy shell, because the super heavy shell has a higher ballistic arc and a longer flight time, than a high velocity shell of sort of Bismarck or Latorio style guns, which means that actually the effective battle range for something firing a super heavy shell is actually shorter than the effective battle range of a one of these sort of warp speed velocity high velocity guns because the the sort of critical flight time at which it becomes mathematically possible to guarantee that you won't be hit, assuming the enemy's halfway decent at aiming, is uh, is a lot shorter. Uh, well, the, the flight time being longer means that the range is a lot shorter for a super heavy shell, um, but when that point is met. And then, of course, you have the fact of whether or not your, your um, guns can even reach that far, which for some guns they couldn't, and also whether your fire control systems are even up to targeting something out that far out, especially given that... Um, when you're talking about those kind of ranges, there were a lot of World War II radars that couldn't reach out that far as sort of to 30 plus thousand yards as fire control radars. Some could, but not all. And this all ties back into rate of fire in as much as, well, again, shell flight time. You've Once you've registered where your shells have hit, you have to correct um, your aim to try and hit again better the next time round. And when you talk about shell flight times in the order of 20 to 30 seconds plus when you're pushing out to the edge of practical battle range on if you really want to be on that by the time you've actually so if you fire off goes the shells the shells land you've now got to spot the fall of shot estimate you've then got to estimate where the fall of shot landed compared to where you thought it was going to land you've then got to make the requisite corrections to your calculations in the fire control system which is going to spit out a new series of numbers which is then going to require you to re-aim your guns and and the turrets, and by the time all of that has passed, you're probably pushing 45 to 50 seconds anyway, which means that for accurate aimed fire at range, you're looking at about a round per minute. No, no matter if your gun can fire two rounds a minute or three rounds per minute, as uh, the Bismarck's guns could when the, the uh, shell hoist system hadn't decided to chew itself to pieces and break down, um, it doesn't matter, because you're just going to be sending good shells after bad. Um, if your if your initial range estimate was out, yeah, sure, fire three three salvos in a minute, and then you see your first salvo land long or short of the target, and then you know that your next two salvos are completely wasted because they're going to land in exactly the same place. Um, you can, of course, do half salvos, which will increase that, and that's this is where the rate of fire becomes more useful, because if you can fire at two rounds a minute then you can fire one salvo at zero seconds, and then you can fire another salvo at 30 seconds, or whatever, whether you want to fire 15, 20 seconds, etc. And at that point, if you're firing in half salvo ladders, it doesn't actually matter that 
your set you don't know the data from your first salvo yet because you will have fired your second half salvo at a different aim point and the idea is then you get two different data points so if you fired your say let's say your front guns at 30 degrees elevation and uh 20 degrees forward of perpendicular to the hull and you fired your rear turrets at 28 degrees elevation and 28 degrees um off off of perpendicular you will then see two sets of splashes then you can start calculating what the difference between the two is and this will then give you a much better idea of where the enemy actually is so having a rate of fire of at least two rounds per minute does allow you to get this half salvo firing off which then obviously um, increases the speed at which you can lock in the actual uh, target position and then you get to um, once you're actually hitting the target then you can try and ramp your rate of fire up a little bit but even then theoretical rates of fire things that you can achieve um, in test conditions etc are not the same as what you can achieve in wartime conditions um, you might well be very your crew gun crews might well be very fatigued the ship might be subject to all sorts of wave motions that you're not particularly liking because battle doesn't allow you to choose the optimal course necessarily um, obviously there's damage to contend with and the fact that well if you're in battle you very 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 definitely do not want to make a mistake like double charging your gun or failing to clear a uh, stuck charge or any kind of error that might result in you blowing your own turret up which means that your crews between that and the fatigue and the stress are necessarily going to be performing slower anyway so there's no point in trying to push them for a maximum rate of fire that doesn't actually avail you of all that much until you've got the the enemy locked in completely and to be honest by the time when you've got the enemy locked in completely if you've landed a couple of creek key critical hits you probably don't need to start a full-on deluge of fire because the chances are you've probably just crippled their ability to fight back meaningfully um, at which point, again, why stress your gun crews further and risk an accident aboard when you can finish them off at your leisure? So all of that is a, sort of a summary of the reasoning behind why I, I tend to say that practical battle range doesn't really go much above 25, 26,000 yards and probably in that 22 to 26 bracket with accuracy increasing as you close things down, which is why a lot of battles even in World War II tended to happen at below that range. And the rate of fire is generally going to be about around a minute, um, unless the very exceptional circumstances apply. And all of that leads us to nearly the conclusion of this very long Patreon edition Q&A. Um, the only additional things is, one, I realised after I'd recorded the segments, put in the timestamps, etc., that I'd forgotten uh, part of the question about the Baltimore class about whether you could put in a, 12, a twin 12-inch turret instead of the triple eight. The answer to that is not really. Um, the general rule of thumb, albeit that it doesn't always apply, but generally is um, go up two inches, drop one gun, but that would give you a twin 10-inch turret, um, not a 12. And when you look at the comparative weights, obviously it doesn't apply for the whole turret, but the gun, the eight-inch gun of the Baltimore weighs just over 17 tons apiece. Um, the... Alaska's 12-inch gun weighs just over 55 tonnes apiece, which means that a single 12-inch gun on an Alaska actually weighs more than all three guns in uh, a Baltimore class's turret. So once you factor in two of those, um, plus the weight of the, the actual turret and barbette itself, it's going to be far too big and far too heavy for a Baltimore class hull. And the only other thing to mention is that while I was recording this, news came in that the hull or the wreck of SMS Scharnhorst, the one from the First World War, has been found off the Falkland Islands. So if you want to uh, read up a bit more about that, Google SMS Scharnhorst found or search engine of choice. And you should see there's some quite interesting photos. Despite the fact it got completely worked over by 12 inch gunfire, it turns out that the high seas fleet did know how to build a pretty durable ship as it's near enough i mean obviously it's not entirely in one piece otherwise it'd still be afloat but it's it's in pretty good condition for a ship that was worked over quite heavily by battle cruisers um certainly in a, a lot better condition than defense and uh and and uh 
yeah, the rest of the first armoured cruiser squadron were at Jutland when they found the wrecks. But anyway, that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening to this uh, nearly two and a quarter hour dry dock, if indeed you still are. And I hope to see you again next week. <laughs>